All right, my name is David Sankel. I'm from Stellar Science. And this topic is monoids, monad monoids, monads, and applicative functors. And actually, I'm really impressed by how many people are here in this room. This title was specifically designed to keep people away. <laughs> and apparently didn't work. I'm at C++ now. So uh, I'm super impressed. You're going to get what you deserve. <laughs> so, so why functional software patterns? Why do we even care about something like this? Um, in a nutshell, if you have your class here, class foo, and you got your private stuff and your public, public stuff, we want to figure out what goes here. What, what should be the public members? So these are principles that are going to guide design. Um, so like I mentioned, like what are the fundamental operations uh, when you have a particular data type that you're working with? Um, and then once you see these patterns, you, know, you, can you can see like, oh, now that I know the kind of thing that I have, uh, these are the kinds of things that the user is going to be able to do with it. And then finally, how does this relate with other classes? These are uh, very, very generic uh, concepts for, that you can compose with each other pretty well. Um, but one thing I just want to mention at the up, up front is that functional patterns are not for the users. Users don't recognize them. If you say, well, just use the monadic bind operation, they're going to say, I don't know what a monadic bind operation is. Uh, maybe at some point in the future, you know, people are going to be more familiar with these kinds of patterns and they can program using these things. But right now, general day-to-day -day stuff, uh, people will revolt if you give them a pure functional interface using these kinds of category theoretical concepts from the get-go. So you're going to have to find better names for these things. Um, and you know, the code can become less clear for them. And generic code is fun. It's super fun to program with these things directly and to use them. But readable code is even better uh, when someone comes back and tries to maintain these things. So a bit of history. How many of you guys have heard of this thing called Haskell? Two or three of you? OK. <laughs> so, the basic idea is that Haskell was an academic programming language that was modeled after math. A bunch of guys got together, and ladies presumably, and they said, we like math so much that it would be great if we could just program in math directly. So let's, let's make a restriction. We're only going to program in math, and we'll see if we can make it efficient somehow. And uh, purity is a really big deal. And I'm sure most of you, since you're familiar with Haskell, you know what purity is. Uh, in a nutshell, you can think of a pure function as one for the same inputs will always return the same result. Um, there's more to it than that, but it's basically one of the driving forces behind Haskell's design. And because of this purity thing, um, Haskell 1.0 was a toy language. They couldn't figure out how to do things in a pure language, particularly uh, I.O. So if you had to do like streams or I.O. in Haskell 1.0, you'd have to use these stream things. It was extremely cumbersome. Uh, and basically, Haskell was a toy language. And that's fine. It's an academic community. They're working on research. They're trying to find new theories and stuff. Practicality is not their goal. So that's the way things were until later on. Then monads hit the stage. And we're going to talk about monads later. Uh, but Eugenio Moji first uses monads to describe model states and exceptions. Monads are something that came from category theory. So he was m trying to model what the meaning of programs were. And he discovered that this thing from category three would be handy to explain the meanings of exceptions. Uh, and then in 1992, Wadler, this guy right here, he decided he'd, he could take this idea of monads and use that as a way to express I.O. operations in Haskell. This was a really big deal, because it made Haskell uh, no longer a toy language, because you could do real things with it. And since that time, in 1992, category theory became popularized in functional programming. So. It's big in the Haskell community. You'll hear category theory all the time. But it basically boils down to 1992 when Weidler found the first use for it in Haskell. So what is category theory? Does anybody know category theory? All of you? OK. So an investigation was started in 1942. This is really old, by Ellen Berg and McLean. And the idea behind category theory was to abstract over the various mathematical domains and map between them. So if, if some of you have taken like some advanced algebra courses, or maybe even some of you have seen this in high school, you start with a core set of axioms. You, you guys have seen what, I'm, what that is? You start with a core set of axioms, and you try to build the whole math from those axioms. So there are different sets of axioms that you can use to build different mathematical um, categories, so to speak. Um, 
And the idea was to try to like, OK, can we say, can we generalize over all these different math, ways of mathematically looking at things? That's what category theory was about. So it's extremely general. And that generality made it applicable to many domains, like computer science, but also even music theory. Um, so there's something, you know, when you, when you think about a pattern uh, in computer science, you're usually thinking of factories and singletons and, and things like that. Those are really based on utility. Um, for whatever reason, people like those things. Now, these kinds of patterns are kind of structures that are found in nature, right? They're, they're not going away. They're kind of like the, the physical laws of the universe. So it's, it's really neat when you get to play with these things and strange things happen. Um, so these are the kind of words you'll hear when it comes to category theory, category, functor, duality, monad, or monad isomorphisms. Um, I'm not going to explain what all those mean, but just to give you a sense, if you hear some of these words, think category theory. And it's all about these widely repeated patterns, patterns in nature. So we're going to start with uh, the easiest category theoretical concept called the monoid. So how many of you guys are familiar with the monoid? Oh, wow, a lot of people. That's great. So a monoid is a type T with a binary operation which combines its values. So you have some type and some binary operation on those types. We're calling it circle with the thing in the middle. Okay. The operation must be associative. That means that, you know, A operation B in parentheses, operation C is the same thing as A operation, these two in parentheses, for any, any A, B, and C which have type T. Okay. This is pretty easy. We've seen this before uh, in early algebra. But there's also a special value, uh, sometimes called empty. And this special value works such that if you apply it on the left side of anything or on the right side of anything, you get the same thing back out of it. So in other words, it's a left or right identity for every value. Question. Um, you say it has a binary operation. Does that mean that if you wanted to have a type that had um, you know, plus minus uh, to multiply, you combine several different monoids to construct that type? OK. Um, I'm not going to repeat your question, but I'm going to try to answer it. So a monoid is a type with a binary operation. So one type can have more than one binary operation that, that forms a monoid. Yeah. So first, an example of uh, a monoid is numeric types with the operation plus form monoids. So you have this property here, the associative property with all numeric types. Uh, someone said, I assume you mean theoretically. Of course I mean theoretically. Yes. <laughs> so the special value here is 0. So 0 plus x equals x plus 0 for every value of x, which is numeric. So we have a monoid. OK, but like I mentioned before, uh, you can form monoids with other operators. So numeric types with uh, the product operator, our monoids. So A times B times C equals A times B times C for all numeric types with the parentheses in the right places. And the special value for multiplication is 1, right? You multiply 1 times anything, you get anything back out the other end. So that's great. So unsigned withstood max forms a monoid. So it has this associative property that you can you know, apply these max with three elements and put the parentheses in any place, and you get the same thing. And 0 is the special value, because max of 0 and x is equal to max of x and 0 is always equal to x for every unsigned x. So does that all make sense so far? All right, then we're going to start to get to the easy stuff. So monoids are all over the place. You can find them everywhere. So what is the E value or the empty value for the float stood min monoid? Anybody have an idea? Is there one with nan? With nan being what it is, is there is that a monoid? Um I don't know. Is it? Minus infinity? Yeah. Okay, minus infinity. Uh, plus infinity. Plus infinity, that's that's a better answer. Um, 
Well, uh, depending on the architecture, you might not necessarily have infinity, so float max if uh, you happen to have one of those strange ones that don't exist. So, <coughs> does std vector form a monoid with something? I heard surely, and I'm not familiar with that function. <laughs> what would be the operator? Concatenation, right? So here's a uh, append operation. So what would be the empty element if append is the thing that forms a monoid with vector? An empty vector. Empty vector. Awesome. So now we're going to talk more generally. If you have a list or a vector of monoids, what can you do with that? You can reduce it by repeatedly applying the combiner operation. Yeah. You can squash them all together. That's pretty much what you can do with monoids. Uh, there's not a heck of a lot. So let's look at some fancy monoids. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with std optional, it's a pretty uh, easy class. Um, a std optional of t is either null or it has a value of type t. Uh, hopefully this is a review for most of you. So if you want to have an optional which is initialized to nothing, you just set it equal to std null opt. And I think this is in C++ 17 right now. Um, and if you want to assign it to something other than null opt, like in this case 3.0, you can do that. If you want to see if it's null opt, you just you know, use the normal bool conversion um, and, and so on and so forth. So we all got optional. We're going to play with it a lot. Um, if anybody has any questions on optional, now's the time to ask because we're going to use it a lot. All right, no questions. Good. Is it a monoid? I heard maybe. Is that a joke? Yeah, it's a joke. That it's maybe a monoid? <laughs> it's, it, it's maybe, maybe. It is maybe, for sure. O only the core, the, the like real Haskell geeks understood that one. So there are actually a couple ways that it can be a monoid. So if you happen to have an optional monoid, then the optional monoid is a monoid, right? And you can implement it like this. If the left-hand side is empty, then you just return the right-hand side. Otherwise, if the right-hand side is non-empty, that means both sides are non-empty, you just apply the monoid operation on the thing inside the optionals and wrap that into an optional. Otherwise, you just return the left-hand side. OK, so can somebody think of another way that we can form an optional monoid? Oh, there's a question. Is it? But now we're defining the monoid type, the type itself. Yeah. So the monoid is always a type. Oh, so the question is, I'm not going to repeat the question. So the type, the, a monoid is a type in combination with an operation. So you can talk about a class of monoids if you talk about a, something like this, right? You can form there's any optional of a monoid can form a monoid using this operation. What's that? So we're going to coerce optional into being a monoid. So we're going to coerce optional into being a monoid. Sure, you can think of it like that. Or rather, it's the operator and the type together that forms the monoid. Exactly. It's the operator and the type which form the monoid. OK. So this one we kind of cheated because we had a monoid on the inside. Is there any way that we can, any other ideas that you might have as to how an optional can form a monoid? Sure. I, I think um, if you have the operation that takes the left optional if it's non nil and, and otherwise takes the right optional and the identity element is nil or null, whatever you're calling that, then, then I think that's the monoid. And OK, so the comment was, was you can take the left optional if it has it, the right optional if it has something in it, otherwise return nil. Well, so what if they both have something in it? You take the left one. Oh, you take the left one, right. Exactly right. So. You know, here's one which I think um, has the right-hand side as the prefer preferential one. So you can just always choose the right-hand side if they both happen to have something. If one of them has something, you give it to one of them, otherwise you return nil. So nil would be your um, 
your empty uh, value. OK. What about functions returning some return value? Does that form a monoid? I hear yes. OK. Oh, you guys saw the answer. So, what, so functions of the same type that return monoids are a monoid. So yeah, what do you think the, the operator is going to be? So I heard function composition. That's right, you can't compose them. OK, so we have functions that have the same input type and the same result type, and the result type happens to be a monoid. How do, what's the operation to make a monoid out of these things? Call the functions. Well, you can call the both functions and then apply the operation of the return value. Yes. You can call both of the functions and apply the operation on the return value. So here we have our append operation taking in two functions that, ta that, have, an uh, that have an argument of type A return to monoid. It's returning a new function, which takes in type A, and it's got to return a monoid. That's what we're returning here. And it applies the left-hand side to the argument, the right-hand side of the argument, and combines them both using the monoid operator. So what would be the empty value for this monoid? Function that always returns the empty type of the underlying one. Yes, a function which always returns the empty type. You see, these aren't like coerced. Like you, if you do, if you take these data types, they usually force you into one kind of uh, monoid or another. So it's just interesting. Now, the real interesting thing about monoids is this property that they can be combined. And this shows up terribly in a projector. But basically, these three blobs here are being combined into one blob. These three blobs here are being combined in this blob, and these three blobs here are being combined in this blob. We're combining all these three blobs into this blob. Does anybody see a benefit of having this kind of a property? You can build big programs out of it. Uh, what do you mean by big? Yes. It's essentially map reduce. Yes, it scales amazingly. MapReduce is a bad name. They should be calling that functor to monoid. <laughs> but as an example of solving a problem with monoids, let's say you have search for the n best occurrences of a word in a million documents. So the key insight here is an n heap is a monoid. So a heap is just a data structure where you can usually, uh, well, how can I explain an n heap? It kind of keeps the best elements in order on their bestness. And uh, you can combine them together, and they form a monoid. Uh, that's the key thing. So you split your documents between different cluster nodes. You send your word to each cluster node. Each cluster node generates a heap algorithm using parallelization, because even on an individual node, you can parallelize um, these monad operations, throwing them together. And then each cluster node sends its heap to a collection node, and the collection node joins the heaps. And you can have even intermediate con collection nodes doing all this for you. So this is just an example of a monoid in practice. So you want to really try to recognize these things and call them what they are. So monoids, they scale very well. Uh, you can compose these things with functions or optionals and other things. And they're extremely common. So now that we're done with the, the easy part, or the very easy part, let's move on to the easy part. A functor. A functor is a class template with a single template parameter and a callable map, which have the following properties. Now I'm going to go through these properties. These are very specific in the language. And then I'm going to give you some intuition for them. So you call map with f. Um, and f is one of these functor. Or no, f is just a function. a is a functor. Uh, a is a functor. f is a callable that accepts a single argument of type t. A is a functor with t as a template parameter. The result type of f of t, uh, where t has type t, let's call that result type u. So the result of the map is the func a functor of type u. This is going to make a lot more sense when I give you the easy explanation. So 
if you happen to have f of t equals t for all of a is t of type t. In other words, if you have some function which is the identity function, then if you map the identity function onto these functors, you're going to get the same value out. And this just say, says that composition uh, holds. So if you map g onto the map of f of a, that's the same thing as mapping g f of a, where g f here is just doing the composition of g and f. So the intuition here is that you can think of functors as kind of like containers. So map takes a function and applies it to the thing on the inside of the container. It ends up resulting in a new container. And the laws here, they just provide reasonable rules that allow map composition. So these things do have laws, and sometimes they can look very complicated, but they're generally what you would want. These are the intuitive laws that you would expect out of something like this. So first example is a std vector. A std vector is a functor. So here's our map function. We take in a function which takes in a, type, a, a value of type t and returns a value of type u. So um, that's what that looks like. And it takes in a vector of type t and it returns a vector of type u. So again, we're seeing we're mapping this vector of one thing into a vector of another thing. And so what we're doing is we're just going on the inside of it and applying that function to each value of a. So the question is, uh, do, does the order of the things in the vector matter? And the answer is yes, because if we like reverse the elements or do something strange, then we really uh, we're hurting ourselves with this law down here, or like the identity law. So if this one, so if we ha if we send that the the function which just always returns its input, and uh, then this thing right here does not hold because this would have a reverse list and this one would have the original list. So that wouldn't work. Good question though. So here I have uh, I'm passing a std function in the previous talk said. Uh, don't do that. And yes, you can make it more efficient by taking a template parameter and passing that in instead. Um, there's a lot of things that you're going to be able to do in here that are going to be more efficient. But my presentation, I'm not going to mention any more of that stuff for now because I want clarity uh, as the number one thing. Once you get the concepts, it'll be easy to optimize them. Maybe. Is std optional a functor? What do you, I heard yes. OK, so then what would its map operation do? It applies the map to the value on the inside if it exists, and otherwise you have no. Yes, exactly. So if something exists in the optional, then it calls f on the thing on the inside, wraps it into optional. Otherwise, it just returns the null optional. Pretty straightforward. What about std set? Is std set a functor? I heard yes, and I heard no. All you're missing is it depends. <laughs> Did anybody say it depends? It depends on what? Oh, this is just a. <laughs> so yes, it is a functor, but it has the added constraint that functions passed to map must return ordered types. So we're playing a little bit here. Uh, not, just, not just that they're ordered, right? It has, don't they also have to be ordered in correctly. the same way? Yeah. No, no they don't. Otherwise, you'll get a set whose elements don't correspond. That doesn't matter. Yeah. In the case of the set, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the important property, I think, that's the key piece. There, no, there, 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 there might be one property, but I'm not sure, is that for distinct input values, the function must return distinct output values. But I'm not even sure if that's necessary. It just has to be a morphism, I believe. Exactly. So OK, there's some question as to whether this is enough of a constraint or whether it's even possible. And um, I haven't thought deeply about this. Was, I think there was some discussion in the uh, functional uh, circles uh, whether it's still behaves as a functor if the size of the resulting set is different than the size of the input set. 
I think it was also a concern at some point to some people. So, it, it's really important, but that, that so in, in Haskell, you can't express, express this functor. Um, but from what I read, this is a functor. But afterwards, anybody who's interested, we'll check the laws and we'll see if this, is a, this assertion is actually true. I believe that it's true. What about pair? Can pair form a functor? Mm, no, because it holds two elements of different types, potentially. So I heard no, because it holds two elements of different types, potentially. But std pair is not a class template with one parameter. That's right. Uh, std if you define a template alias that fixes one of those two parameters, the, that alias is a function. Very good. Yes. If you fix one of the template parameters, then you do get something with one template parameter, and then you can form a functor. Actually, they, yeah, but the, the, the reason why you put the uh, single template parameter uh, thing in the definition, I think, is that in Haskell, it's uh, not possible to uh, express n-array uh, functors in generic way. So you have functor, bifunctor, and so on. But in C++, thanks to function polymorphism, you can actually do that. So you can have a function that will take either of the types that is in the pair, and the laws will hold. So the comment was, uh, there are things called bifunctors, and you can, you can actually do multi-argument functors. So that's true, but we're, we're not going to go there. For the context of this intro, we'll just assume that you have one template parameter. Um, all right. So here's how you do the map. This one just applies the, the function to the thing on the right-hand side of the pair. So you can, form, you can use a pair. You, you can form a functor out of a pair two different ways. You can either apply the, functor, uh, apply the, operation, the function on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. What about a function? Is a function a functor? I hear yeses, so how do we do that? We apply the function to the return, which is the result of calling this function. So we apply the function to the result of calling the std function. Yes, and uh, of course, we've got to fix all the parameters if we're doing that. So we have one thing that we're modifying. Um, and we're building a new function which transforms the result of the old function. So here's the std function functor map. So here we have the function which we're applying to the thing on the inside of the functor. This is the functor. So it, p is the parameter. This is the thing that's fixed. Uh, the re re result type is t here, and it's u here. So we're going to do something to modify that. Uh, and here's the conversion from t to u. So here we make a new function, and it applies a to the parameter applies f to change the results, and then you get your map on functions. And it's really just function composition. And it's really just function composition, and that's absolutely correct. Um, yes? I, I need to ask a really brief question, and I'm apologizing in advance. But, but where's all this leading? <coughs> right? it, I, I look at this, and like, these are really interesting little puzzles. Mm -hmm. but what, what insight do they provide me for writing code? That's a good question. <laughs> Chandler? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'll say what I'm getting out of this. I don't know if other people are getting out of this. I'm getting a better working understanding of the category theory term functor as opposed to my kind of pragmatic programmer term functor which I did not have before, and I'm hoping will help me understand the later half of this talk. <laughs> okay. But maybe that's just me. That, yeah, how does it help me improve my programs? That's yeah, yes. So the question is, how does it help me improve my programs? And uh, I would tell you right now, but I don't think that you understand enough yet. So what I'm doing is I'm building up. <laughs> I'm building up a little bit more, and... I didn't bring my tomatoes. <laughs> uh, thank you for not bringing your tomatoes. I appreciate it. So, 
Functors allow for transformations within stuff. So each map strips away one layer of your data type. Say you have a std vector of an optional of an int, and you want to get strings for each int on the inside. Here we're using functor map calls to get that. So first this function takes in the int and converts it into a string. This takes in the optional and maps that function on the optional to get the string, the optional string. And then f3 here takes in the vector and maps that function onto the elements of the vector. So uh, this is one way to implement this function. There are no loops going on here. We're using these higher level operations to get to the inside. So does everybody understand that so far? Because it's going to get harder. And hopefully more interesting. If not, I'm out of here before I get the tomatoes. So applicative functor. An applicative functor is a functor with two extra operations, pure and apply, which obey the following rules. So we got a functor. Now we have this applicative functor. We got a new operations here. So first we have pure of t. So t is of type t, and it results in a value of type applicative of t. So in other words, this is something that you use to create the container from a value. And then we have the apply operation. This is a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, AFF stands for applicative functor function. AFV is applicative, fu applicative functor value. Um, so basically, you have an applicative where the t is a function itself. And you have an applicative which has a value on the inside. So you have a wrapped function and a wrapped value. And you are s taking these two, sticking them together to get a wrapped result. It's just like map on the function instead of applicative and you take it out before applying it? Yes, exactly. So the comment was, this is just like map, except the function is already in the applicative. Yes, exactly. So there's some laws here. And uh, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> the intuition here is that pure wraps a value into the container. And apply applies the contained function to a contained value to get a contained result. And know that, note that apply here can be extended to n argument functions. You would just have to have n values to apply it to in order to make this work. So the std optional applicative functor. What do you think pure does? It makes a std optional. It makes a std optional. And what is the value of that std optional? Is it going to be empty? Nope. It's going to be that value wrapped, exactly. So pure for a std optional would be this. What about apply? What if the value is null? Uh, it doesn't do anything? Yes. So, you, so they both need to actually have a value. And then if they both have a value, you apply the function to the value. And this is, I'm doing an implicit conversion here, but this will wrap it into an optional. Otherwise, if one of them are null, then you get a null optional. So let's look at the applicative functor properties here. So let's say I've got some code. Um, I said a equal to something, and these are all optional doubles, b equal to something. And now I apply plus to a and b, and I apply negate to c to get d. Does anybody find this interesting? Yeah. Why is it interesting? <laughs> I hear yes. Why would this be interesting? What's going on here? Uh, I'm sorry? Shouldn't plus and negate be inside an optional? Um, yeah, so assume this is getting converted into a, into an optional comment. We have effectively lifted um, yeah, all the operations on the, on the numbers to, um, yeah, to the optional numbers. So the comment is that we've lifted the operations on the numbers to the optional numbers, yes. And if A happens to be null, all the rest of this stuff just gets null. 
if this happens to, well, this won't get null. But if either A or B are null, all the rest of these things be, are null. So this kind of is acting like an error, like a percolating error going through. Do you ever uh, define why it applies? Do more than, a version of apply that takes more than the two arguments so you can actually cast three? So the comment was, did I ever a, a give a version of apply that takes multiple arguments? I did not present one, but I postulated that it existed with authority. So, I mean, so far, this doesn't do anything that map doesn't. So the comment is, so far, this doesn't do anything that map doesn't. Yes. Very good. Um, so here we have, so the idea is that we're getting error propagation going through here. This is what the applicative functor on optional provides for you. So let's say you're doing something else, like where you have some value, you're fetching a command, maybe this is going to a server, so you don't know what command you get. Um, you have some function which converts commands into functions. You apply that to the command, now you have an optional function. And here we apply the function, which is wrapped because it's an optional function, to uh, pure my value to get the result. This is kind of like the inverse of the thing we saw on the previous slide. But we get the same kind of idea. It's error propagation. Is std vector an applicative functor? What do you guys think? Okay, so if it's a functor, then it must have a map and it must have a pure. So uh, what would apply be for a std vector? So you got a vector of functions and a vector of values. What is the result going to be? What, are you, what can you do with this? So I heard comment that you can map every function to every value. Yep, and that's exactly how you would define it. So with this applicative functor, you get non-determinism. So I have a vector of A's, I have a vector of B's, and here I apply plus to the A's and B's, and I get all the possible values, uh, sums with the A's and the B's. So this model's non-determinism. It's very interesting, but is it useful? So there's a lot of applicative functors. Stood future is an applicative functor. Uh, continuations are applicative functors. You can model exception style errors as applicative functors. Um, behaviors in functional reactive programming, parsers, etc. So I want to give a concrete example as to how this might actually be useful. Parser applicative functors. So the question is, what are the fundamental, fundamental operations for a parser? Is this insight into applicative functors going to help us out with that? Um, of course it is. Why else would it be up here? So we're going to define a parser class. So let parser of t be a stood in, uh, standard input parser that parses into a value of type t. This is just a very simplified uh, parser thing. So we have the special read operation. And read will try to read from standard input and produce a value uh, of type t from it. If it succeeds, it'll return type t. Otherwise, it throws an exception. Generally, I'm not really caring that much about error handling here. Um, there are some important members here. Um, so first we have the M reader. This is the thing that read calls. So that's pretty straightforward. We have a special Boolean which tells you whether, this is an internal thing, that tells you whether the parser consumes nothing. It's always going to return a result without consuming anything. And then we have a vector of characters which give you the possible start characters for this parser. This allows us to combine parsers in a uh, efficient way. OK, does all that make sense? If you have any questions on that, this would be a good time to ask. All right. So we have some friend functions here that produce parsers, because if you saw on the previous slide, the constructor is private. So read any character from standard input. That's really easy. Just reads one character from standard input, returns that as a result. That's what the read function is. This one reads a particular character from standard input. Um, and then we have this either thing that combines two different parsers together, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So if the stream begins with the right character for the left-hand side, it'll go ahead and use the left-hand side parser. Otherwise, it'll just use the right-hand side parser. So it gives you a way to combine parsers and use that or thing. So you're going to have to definitely structure your grammar right in order to work with this parser. Um, here's another uh, built-in parser, so zero or more. It'll take in a parser, and it will try to repeatedly run that parser on your input until it can't anymore, and then you get a parser of a vector as a result. Um, we're going to look at the implementation of either. 
So we have a parser, which is the left-hand side, and a parser, which is the right-hand side. We want to write a parser, which is going to be either one or the other as the result. So here's the result. It's going to consume nothing if the left-hand side consumes nothing. All right, so if the left-hand side consumes nothing and always runs, then this thing is always going to hit the left-hand side. It's always going to consume nothing. The start character is going to be the combination of the start characters of the left-hand side parser with the start characters of the right-hand parser. So the resulting parser can actually have the combination of the both. Um, this could be using a set or something like that. We really don't care. And now the reader. So the reader is going to peak standard input. If the left-hand side start character, if the left-hand side start character set happens to have that character in it, then I'm going to return the read of the left-hand side. Otherwise, I'm going to return the read of the right-hand side. And that's it. And I just return the result. So here we're just combining parsers using this either thing. But I already said that this thing is going to be an applicative functor, which means there needs to be two uh, important operations on it. The first is pure. So does anybody have an idea what pure would be for this parser data type? Anybody besides Sebastian? Uh, would it be to parse a single or character? It would return that character that it would create a parser that actually returns that character. A parser that returns that character. Uh, you're very close, Sebastian. So pure is basically returns a parser that parses nothing and always returns the thing passed to pure. A parse pure returns a parser which uh, reads nothing from the input and always returns that as the character. Is that right? Uh, that's exactly right. So we're calling this success, um, not pure. Remember, because we're giving a user interface that users are going to like, not that functional programmers are going to like. So the start character here is going to be nothing. It doesn't really matter because it consumes nothing. The reader just returns the value. It doesn't do anything with standard input, and it returns the result. So that's pure. What's apply? Any ideas of what apply would be? So what what are what are the arguments going to be to the apply function? Well, a parser that returns a function and a parser that returns a value. A parser that returns a function and a parser that returns a value. That's absolutely correct. So what is this parser going to do that combines the parser that returns a function with the parser that returns a value? Yes, exactly correct. So it'll parse, it'll run the function parser, it'll run the value parser, and apply the function to the value and return it. So this one, I gotta drag it down a little bit. So it consumes nothing only if the f parser consumes nothing and the t parser consumes nothing. If the f parser consumes nothing, then the start character is going to be. Uh, what the t parser start character is. Otherwise, the start character is going to be what the f parser uh, does. But this is the, the real body of the thing. So we run the f parser read to get the function. We take the t parser read, we get the value, and return f of t to get the result. And that's it. And actually, we're done with our parser. Everything else can be based on those simple operations. For example, here we have a digit parser. So this is going to parse the input and look for a character from 0 to 9. Um, here we use this either to get all these individual character parsers put together into something that will read one of those. And uh, we take our success parser. This does nothing but returns this function. And uh, that character. This function in here basically just converts the character into a int, and we get our digit parser. Now, if we want a full int parser, um, we use the digit parser. We apply zero or more digits to it, and we apply the success parser with a function here which converts your digits to int. Now, this apply success, apply success is a common pattern. It's the same thing as map. 
Um, and you'll pro if you're making your parser combinator library, you'll probably provide map, which is implemented in terms of these other things here. Um, a lot of times you have like an operator greater than greater than like a shift operator for parsers. So you want to uh, take the A parser and then do the B parser and combine them together into a parser of a pair of A and B. So you can do that using apply. Um, and then here would be an example of a parser which reads an int followed by another int. So just auto int parser followed by a space character followed by the int parser and you're done. So this is, this, is, this is why this is interesting. So I've seen a lot of examples of people come up, coming up with domain specific languages and all the fundamental operations are just kind of random as to what's being chosen as the fundamental operations. Do you, do you have an example where you actually don't use success P to build up the uh, parser that produces a function? Do I have an example that doesn't use success P? In the first, it doesn't use, it uses apply, the full power apply as opposed to map. Yes, so an example is to, is to where you, you don't need the full power of apply, just map. And the example would be is if something that you're parsing, you parse it into a function, and that's going to modify stuff later on. So, so okay, so you don't have one of your slides? I don't have one of my slides, no. So this would essentially be like a, a lack of context freeness in your parsing. Where you actually like build up a subsequent like transformation by parsing the text, and subsequent parsing then becomes context dependent. So. Well, because in that case you would have to have the earlier parser parse something that is used as the later parser, and that's not the case, even if you use the full power of apply. I, I sorry, yeah, I guess it's not technically being uh, context dependent. The semantics become context dependent, but the parsing remains context free. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, um, for example, if you parse a plus or minus, and you build a function from that, and either the function negates the result of the next parser, or it doesn't, and then you parse an int, and then you apply this parsed plus or minus to the parse. That, that's a great example. Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure I understood that conversation, so I'm not going to repeat it, but it sounds like it got resolved, which I'm happy about. So, since you mentioned context-free, I can see how this can parse a regular language, but I'm not seeing how you can do a context-free language. Okay, so the, com the, the comment was, I can see how you can do a regular language of this, but not a context-free language. Um, it may be possible, but I'm not seeing it. So, if this were a monad, a monad, it would be po more powerful. And I think that might hit what you're getting at there. Um, so anyway, but, but the idea is, is if you understand these structures and you're trying to solve a problem and you recognize them, you're going to nail those fundamental operations and you're going to get as powerful as you want. Sometimes people accidentally come across them, or sometimes people come up with operations which when you combine them, they can get you these fundamental operations. Um, but if you nail the fundamental operations from the get-go, then you solidify your interface and everything's built on top of it. It's much better overall. There's no more private parts being shown everywhere. So to review, monads, these are highly parallel pat patterns when you see them. Look for them if you have a highly parallel problem. And, they can, and you can scale this like crazy. Functors, you do things to the stuff on the inside of the thing. That's what map's all about. And apl applicative functors allow you to put stuff on the inside, and the stuff on the inside can do things to the stuff on the inside. So now let's talk about monads. We got this, right? Everybody's good here? All right. A monad is an applicative functor with an extra operation called join, which obeys the following rule. Join of A where A is of type monad of monad of T, so again, we have like this nested thing on the inside, results in a value of type monad of T. That's it. A monad is just an applicative function with this extra operation. So the monad laws are a bit uh, more complex to express in C++, but I want to give you the intuition behind them. So if you have a, a monad of a monad of a monad, 
you can map to join the thing on the inside, or you can join the thing on the outside. It's basically saying that the order shouldn't make a difference, whether you join the thing on the inside or the thing on the outside. And similarly for pure and join. Uh, okay, I think apply. You, better, you better describe that again with more words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And an example, a concrete example. Okay, so there's a request for an example of how the joining on the outside in or inside out should be. Okay, and uh, we got chalk here. We can do this. Can you guys see the, over the chalkboard okay? Well, I haven't put any chalk on it, so you have no idea. Anyway, if you have an optional... All right, lights are coming in a minute. If we have, okay, we're waiting for the lights. Hold that thought. So this website right here, this will give you the laws in their uh, their detail. Awesome. All right. You've got an optional of an optional event. No, no, no. We need to have another optional here. How did I get to that point in the first place? The easiest answer is uh, is null opt. Well, I mean, if you go back to the previous slide, there was a if you have a that's what you're that's what you're trying to do here, right? The case the case you have is you have an optional of int, and you apply a function that takes that optional of int uh, and no, returns another option of int, and then you map that function. Okay, so the so join isn't the real use case. The real use case is coming, I yeah. guess, in a few slides. Yes. So a join, join is pretty much. You guys are helping. A helper. Okay. This is a helper function. First, first question: Do you understand the signature of join? Let me look at it again. I, you you made it go away a little too fast. Okay, here it is. <clears throat> yeah, it looks like it, it looks like it flattens. Yes, it flattens. Okay. Now we're talking about the law that it has. If I have, so if I flatten the inside first and then the outside, okay. that should be the same as the outside. Okay, we got it. All right, you guys can hit the lights again. So does anybody have an idea as to what join for stud optional would look like? <laughs> Sebastian's just nailing this today. <laughs> Join for optional basically says if the outer optional is null up, then return null up. Else look inside. If the inner optional is null up, return null up. Else return the inner. How many levels does Yes. So join just goes one level. Here, here's the implementation. So join takes in an optional of an optional of t. And if it has a value, it'll return the thing on the inside. If it doesn't have a value, it just returns null opt. And we get the optional t. So we flatten it. That's all. It's pretty simple. Um, there are other monads, like uh, yes. Sorry, this slide also says similarly for join and pure. What, what does that mean? Or should we? Um, <clears throat> this is a typo. Um, I'm going to punt on that one because. But you can see it on this web page. Okay. But it'll do the thing, the kind of thing that you would expect, if that if that helps. <laughs> okay. Okay. Test one two. Okay, it's on the, so you must have turned it off. I must have turned it off. That would make this. Okay.
Just one, two. Or for example, there's one example too. For example, uh, you you have this function with three parameters, and you want to feed the, those parameters from the return return values from another function, which is fed from another function and another function. And there's a tree. That tree is can be tra traversed with a simple apply from you know, we, what do you call it that first that first search. Right. From the, from the very leaf to the root, and uh, by traversing each of those elements, uh, basically your tree is actually an array traversed at, uh, at the right order. So, there are a bunch of examples given. That's awesome. Um, maybe at this point, you're only convinced that applicative functors apply to parsers. But there's a lot more they apply to. Um, so other monads, we talked about parsers. Uh, and it turns out that a, a parser with a monadic operation is, can be fundamentally uh, less efficient than a monad, which is just applicative functor. This is one of the properties. It depends on how much you want to expose. Um, functions with a single parameter of type A are also monads. So what's the big deal with monads? And that's the monad bind operation. So the monadic bind operation is defined in terms of the other operations. So given a monad of type T, you can define this bind operation. So it takes in a monad of type T and a function which takes in a value of type T and produces a monad of type U. And the result here is a monad of type U. Usually you would use uh, you'd like bind to be an operator overload. So we're just going to use uh, right shift for this. So let's say I've got this kind of code here. I have this uh, optional int thing, so optional is a monad. Um, and I'm using this bind operation to compose these different things. And maybe you don't quite see what's going on here yet. So if we indent this a little bit differently, now we see a little bit more structure. Now if you squint your eyes, you might see something like this. And now if you cross your eyes, <laughs> you'll see something which looks like this. This looks a lot like an imperative computation, right? But this is all in the optional monad. And that was a really big deal for Haskell. Because IO is a monad. And if you can write stuff like this and have it be purely functional, that's wonderful. Now it's not a toy language anymore. But that's great for Haskell. This is not a Haskell conference. What do monads do for us? They express different models of computation within C++. Stood vector. This gives you a language with non-determinism, right? Just based on how the stood vector monad is. Stood optional provides a language with error fall through. You can make a continuation language. I'm not sure you mentioned the non-determinism when we originally discussed vector as mono as, as a functor, but I'm not sure if everyone knows what that means. Oh, OK. Uh, what is non-determinism? Who's got a good answer as to what non-determinism is? Fall twice, so oh, get different results. It means you explore all possible paths. It means you explore all possible paths, yeah. But you write your code in a way that looks like normal imperative computation. You're making a domain-specific embedded language which models non-determinism, including variable capture, right? Now, you can make a better syntax for this, uh, or a live. There. This is only if you squint. Yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just trying to get from, from C to pure. Actually, it's, you get from all of them. Never mind. It's just, I'm trying to put a syntax on that, and there's not one, really. Line breaks do something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, it also allows you to provide more control over computation. So if you write your computations in a monadic domain-specific embedded language, which are fully general, um, you can serialize and deserialize computations that are actually typed in. You can uh, make a command pattern embedded language. So like if you normally have a command pattern because you want to have undo in your project or whatever, you know, you have these single commands and then you can undo the commands and that's it. But if you recognize that these are monadic, then you can take the result of some commands and based on the results of com some commands, do these other commands, combine that all together into one command and still provide your undo stuff. So you're really expanding the possibilities to everything that's possible. Or you can do imperative template metaprogramming if you're into that kind of thing. I prefer functional template metaprogramming myself. So let's wrap it up. This is just the beginning. This is just an intro into the functional patterns that are out there. Uh, here are some more interesting ones. You got semi-groups. So these are basically like uh, monoids but without an identity operation. So you can convert a semi-group into a monoid using an optional, for example. There are categories, there are arrows, there are co-monads. Co uh, all these things have co, like there's co-arrows, co-categories. But anyway, all of these different things um, have interesting properties that you can recognize in systems and you can figure out what the fundamental basis operations are. And you can get pretty far. You'll end, uh, what I find personally is that I end up creating um, uh, libraries that are more powerful than what I was originally aiming for. And I just did not realize from the get-go that's what I was playing with. So that's it. Uh, monoid functor, applicative functor, monad. If, uh, if you found this to be too mathematical, it's your own fault. I named this appropriately. <laughs> um, do we have any questions? Fundamental basis operations that correspond to these these mathematical concepts and what make sure that you have them so the question is okay you recognize this stuff what do you do with it right well I, I have to so I, I have to admit that like the gang of four book was a complete failure for me like so you know maybe <laughs> it's just me I you know I just don't relate to design patterns mm -hmm. or whatever but it was like you know, I went and I tried to apply it, and that was a big mistake. Then eventually, because I, w I wasted a lot of time adding layers of abstraction and decoupling to my code, then I met Kevin Henney on, on a train on the way to a conference, and he explained to me that you're not supposed to apply design patterns. Okay, so I'm not supposed to apply them. How are they gonna, how are they gonna make my coding life better? So the question is, how, how are these going to make your coding life better? You are going to be informed of the very powerful op, uh, mathematical things that occur in nature. And if, if, you re if you are trained in recognizing these in the domains that you're trying to solve, you're going to save yourself a lot of time, and you're going to identify the fundamental operations without having to do the work to try to figure out what they are. Because if you try to figure out what they are on your own and they happen to map to these categories, you're probably going to miss them. I, I, don't, I don't think that I have too much problem deriving the right concepts from the, from the concrete use cases. I mean, this is like, this is something I, I think I know how to do. And I do it without ever thinking of these things. And so I'm trying to, I, like, you know, I really want to, a lot of people are excited about this stuff. I want to get what, what is it that's going to change my life here? And I'm still not getting it. So I think, I think one, one, one valuable part of this is that these concepts, they're really concepts, right? Well, except for one thing. Okay, here's, a, here's my beef with this, with this type pattern uh, based program, is that with, with an ordinary concept, it's, it generally, it has a, it has a definition that, that includes relatable ideas. And, and you use it to constrain a generic function. That without 
constraining without having a constraint on the generic function, mm -hmm. there is no point in having that concept. Yep. All right. So I have not seen a single generic function here presented that well, operates on you have on monad. One. Wait, just wait. And and I know that there are some. Yeah. But what what I, what I also know happens is like the generic functions that come up in the STL, you can make a plain English description of what they do, and now you have a higher level abstraction. The the ones that operate on things like monad, the only way to describe what they do, because monads can be like such diverse things. It's I.O. over here and it's a list over here, mm -hmm. right? The only way to describe what they do is in terms of these very abstract laws. And I don't end up with an abstraction I, I know how to reapply in those cases. And what I, what I see over and over again, what I observe when people talk about this stuff, mm -hmm. is that is that they find much more value in recognizing these things as patterns, just like what David is presenting here, than in using them as constraints on generics. So I get that in some sense it's a concept, mm -hmm. no problem, but it doesn't function like a concept in terms of programming models for most people. So I was going to bring a, uh, an example of, of a monoid. Okay. Because still accumulate should yeah. be constrained with monoid. Yes. Um, and yes, monoid is, is, is a, on, a, on a high level of abstraction, which means that the functions that are constrained by monoid are also on a high level of abstraction. And I think the point is that when you learn to think on that level of abstraction, then you can use these functions that are constrained on monoid, and there are actually quite a few. And and, and when you use them, then basically whenever you find, you, when you discover that whatever you're working on is a monad, you say, oh, I have this big library of ready-made functions that do something with that. And yes, it's on a high level of abstraction, which makes it a little harder to understand, but, but the utility is there. Okay. Even if it's not as clear as, I don't know. Can you give me so an example of a powerful generic function that, that is constrained by a monad? Well, sequence is a very simple one, okay. which is basically have a list of monads, join them all together. It's basically a sum over. Right. So, so now, here's so here's my beef yeah. with with generics on on things mm -hmm. like uh, on on these type classes. You have this thing sequence, which is takes a list of monads and joins mm -hmm. them all together. What does this mean for I O? It means execute these I.O. operations in sequence. Okay, what does it mean for list? What is the list monad? Uh, the list monad is uh, non-determinism. Non so basically you have a, a sequence of operations. Each one says for any given input, there are multiple possible output values. Yeah. And the function returns all of them at once. And basically sequence in that case is just chain them together. And exponentially build that huge okay. tree of possibilities. All right, so here's what I'm saying. Yeah. Those two things have almost nothing in common from a high-level point of view. It's, it is very hard to describe what sequence does in any kind of terms that are relatable, other than in terms of uh, type structure. That's absolutely true. And, <laughs> and so what you don't end up with, and see, for me, Programming model is really, really important. Having relatable, relatable ideas that, because otherwise, I, I just feel like it's it's all too hard to use. Right. So let me let me let Chandler answer or make a comment or no, he's just got his hand up. He's just looking really weird. He's got like this. I don't know. Unrelated. Okay. Okay. I don't, I don't know, I, I kind of agree with Dave, I don't know that I would ever want to have a generic library that tried to exploit these patterns on these generic constructs. But I do think that if I'm working with a particular piece of code, and it is quite close to one of these patterns, and I'm struggling with how to implement a particularly complex kind of additional piece of functionality in that code, 
recognizing the pattern, kind of finishing the, the, the fit with the pattern, and then using the techniques here to compose more powerful <coughs> constructs might be useful. Personally, I would always write it out. Sure. Right? Like it, because that way I have a domain and I can, I, I, I say, say, right, you can talk about what it will do. But this might give me a kind of nice pattern to, to structure the implementation in a way that I will not end up painted into a corner and unable to like uh, handle the next layer of complexity that comes my way. Sure, look, I mean, that's, that's, that's my perspective. That's a nice theory. And maybe it even works for some people. But what hasn't been done here is nobody's shown me how that actually works in practice. Like what I'd like to see is a, is a programming problem. Here I've got a problem. I'm trying to solve, I'm trying to figure out how to, like I just recreate the scenario Chandler said. I'm trying to figure out how to do this complicated thing in this problem. Like say a parser. Oh, I recognize here I have a monad. Yes. Ah, this, this reveals something to me about how to solve the problem. Now, now I can understand the value of monad, monad if I see that. So, so but I've I have never seen that. So, so I thought the parser example, for me, the parser example did that for applicative bumpers. Yeah, I was missing a joint example. What problem, what problem did he run into in, in implementing his parser that he was able to solve by recognizing that it was an applicative uh, bumper? I mean, I mean, he structured it differently, right? He didn't start with the problem. But I've written enough parsers that like, when he showed his parser, I can see like, ah, I won't hit you know, a handful of the common problems that I have hit with parsers in the past by structuring it this way. And, and, and the classic example is the one that, that Sebastian and I talked about, right? Structuring a parser uh, in this way so that when you parse out a, a sign uh, you know, operation and then parse out an integer, that you actually you know, build a function to negate the integer, right? And that the, the composition actually allows you to do that and allows when the parse fails at either point to kind of propagate that failure in a sane way without without like special casing each example of it. And, and, and this brings us back to the early question about regular languages and more powerful languages, right? A functor parser cannot parse something more comp something very complicated. And mon a monadic parser, because monad is more powerful, can. So I don't I don't know if that answers your question, but it shows that, that a monad is more powerful than a functor. I, I knew that. It's got more <laughs> so, requirements. So in that case, <laughs> the, the, quite, the, the fact that the monadic bind takes a value and returns an instance of the monad means that you can parse something and then based on that return either return a parser that is later used to parse the remaining input. Mm -hmm. Actual context. Yeah, I always so understood that, that too. Yeah. I understood how, you know, I, I've read a lot yeah. about how to, you know, use these things and map. I see how monad maps onto parsers. I don't see why you should necessarily build your parser that way. It's not, it isn't obvious to me that that, that is mean, like the. Yeah. I mean, what, what, one, 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 interesting, one interesting case is if you look at uh, futures in C++, and say we have future continuations. We say yeah. something that returns a future dot then has another function that returns a future dot then, and then you get this nested ab abomination. Um, and in theory, a weight is a special syntax that could apply to any kind of model. It doesn't in C++, but it could, and that's exactly what do notation in Haskell really is. And that's a case where you can say, okay, here I have this special notation for for things that are monads. And it gives me a nice way to work with these abstractions. In, in, in Haskell, continuation-based programming never needed any special syntax because Haskell already had the special syntax for all monads. The do notation. Mm -hmm. And using that is really nice in Haskell. <coughs> and we invented okay. special syntax in C++. All right, so what, what I get you saying here yeah. is, is that recognizing, recognizing the value of monads mm -hmm. and, and the value of particular syntax trigger for monads is a valuable tool for language designers. <laughs> right? And, <laughs> yeah. and 
but it no, I mean, because, you need, because you need syntax sugar. This is specifically this is syntax sugar. This is syntax right? sugar, yeah. And and I I don't I'm the last person to denigrate anything as syntax sugar. I believe you know syntax sugar is powerful. But this is a language level decision that you have to make in order to get this kind of syntax sugar. It's also an optimization. Yeah, uh, a weight is not purely syntax sugar. It's not purely syntax. But that's that's a different conversation. But I don't think that statement is. Well, yeah, but having this having is how you describe the benefit in C plus plus, like when you have a you have like say Lean or Python, that's actually well, in C sharp it's actually extensible like a monad. In Python it's not, but having that would allow you to write. The do style notation, which you do, and yeah. it has cool as well, mm -hmm. um, which would make you that way. That way, when you start implementing yeah. these operators, you have a standard way of doing the operations. And like, if you were able to do that in C plus, you could write a computation. That computation could actually go out and work on ranges. It could work on heterogeneous sequences, possibly even computing at compile time instead. Or it could be going out and doing a SQL query or other types of stuff. So there's all different kinds of stuff that you can do if you actually have the monad comprehension. So you've had your hand up for a while. Um, could you just give us the definition of bind again with bio counts? Mm -hmm. um, the, the definition in, oh, there it is, yeah, thank you. Did you have your hand up, Sean? Sounds like what you're saying is it's in part of uh, uh, a tool for building up that internal consistency that you were talking about uh, yeah. in the keynote that that constitutes a certain kind of correctness yes. in yes. the program. You have you have more confidence in that part. Yes. I mean that part I understand. Yeah. So I just want to I somewhat agree with you, which is which is I've struggled with this before. It's like if I had a whole library of these very low-level functional primitives, would I ever try to construct something out of it? And it's like, probably not, right? Like, 
I had a library that provided a, a, a license category, would I actually use that? Probably. Yeah, so <laughs> would you ever, would you know what to do with an algorithm that was constrained on placement category? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's not and that's not what I'm advocating for either. I, I get that. Okay. I get that. So I mean part of part of this comes from, you know, like I'm working on Swift. We need to decide like how important are our higher kind of types in Swift. Like we want to get them into the language at some level. Do we do we really is like being able to constrain on things like like represent this in the language really the important thing? Or is or is the important thing about this the the insights you get from the patterns. And that's part of what I'm here to get from the talk. So I, I'm getting that you're saying it's about the patterns. I think for, for it depends on your audience, yeah. but based on the normal C++ audience, it depends, it's the pattern, right? It's not, you're not providing a, oh, here's my monad for, uh, for parsers. Now go ahead, use your custom do notation to handle it. Like, I, I sort of like it's nice, but I'm getting out of this is all about the pattern, not like, like I get secondary benefits from pattern recognition. I don't really care about this being baked in some way into some formalism in the language. <laughs> the library. Are there any intermediate representations that make it easier to identify what these things are? Um, so you've got a real world problem. Are there any intermediate representations? So I'll tell you what I do is I'll try to figure out what it is in math, the problem that I'm trying to solve. And that, and that gets rid of a lot of the noise, and it makes it easier, for, easier to see the patterns. But I don't expect everybody to follow that same uh, strategy. Where do you draw the line between category theory and abstract algebra? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I I don't see a line. I see it as a as a, as a bunch of stuff that it's all math. Yes. Has anyone ever used JavaScript promise libraries? Anytime? Yeah. That's the perfect example of a monad. It, it shrinks and flattens the continuation into a single instruction list, which is all which all of them are. Uh, Dude, I know what a monad is. That is not the question. I mean, what's the point yeah. in recognizing that it is one? Like, like it's, it's somebody who, who writes who writes a library that, that has a continuation language based on this. The thing for me has been like, okay, we understand that like a feature of continuation is a monad. We haven't seen the payoff of what that means yet. So I would say stood future sucks. And if it was recognized as a monad it's from the get-go, and to have the, yeah, have the right fundamental option. I think that they would have exp some of the operations might have been might have matched clearer to to the Haskell. Operation. I'd like to hear David's answer. I think I if it matches clearer to the Haskell because that doesn't change the usability experience for C++ programmers in principle. What's, so I think that recognizing it as a monad, I think that the designers of it would have seen the potential, uh, more potential in terms of the syntax for it, and would have provided users with that syntax. So. Um, like then, I think would be the biggest one. It could be improved. Like I haven't sat down and thought about about it, but I know that when I work with Stud Future, I just feel like this is a monad and it looks like something else, and it makes it harder to use. Take this as a as a cue about how to how to spread the idea that you're trying to work on here. Like, take this concrete example. Show what what changes about the design once you recognize that it's a monad. Okay. That that would change everything. Every okay, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the same. It's the same <laughs> idea. So Chandler, you had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Better, better how? Like, like I want to like see what like. Like, make, design me a better future. <laughs> 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 nice. So Chandler? So, so I was there when, when we were discussing the design of the future, and I can give really specific examples of where 
actually associating with the monadic operations <coughs> and their their model would have like saved the committee at least three hours of, of my life at least <laughs> several other people's lives. Um, when we start when we finally decided to add dot then we couldn't figure out the actual API because there there are two operate there are two possibilities one of them unwraps automatically and the other one doesn't and we didn't yeah. even have a model for it, thinking about which one of these two APIs is the better API to expose to users and if we had actually like thought about the mathematical underpinnings we might have converged on a a, a good choice for this API and, and without spending like you know three hours of 20 people's time in a room debating it without any like basis at all mm -hmm. I think that's, it's also that's a question one place where we, we, we got fit by this this is a little tangential, but looking back at the definition of bind, um, the thing that I've been struggling with is, so we have a function that uh, takes you know, t and um, returns a monad, right? And I think of apply, maybe I'm misremembering the definition of apply, but I think that apply unpacks m, um, passes it to the function. The function returns a monad, and apply returns that monad. So why do we need to join on the return value from apply? Because the function f returns a monad. And apply is going to wrap it in a monad. Yeah, I think the thing that was missed here is that apply uh, rewraps the value in the application. Yeah, apply doesn't extract any values from a monad. It it the, the same category. Yeah. So I know we're over, so. Yeah. We don't have to, the conversation doesn't have to end, but it does have to go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> right. So.